Hi and welcome to Magic Numbers. This is episode 74 and this time we're doing the full set review and I'm doing it not alone but with Trumpetman. If you don't know who Trumpetman is then you're missing out uh, because he's running an excellent podcast called uh, 40 Card College and also was a guest on a couple of other podcasts including uh, um, Limited Level Ups and uh, I have to say, 40 Card College is one of my favorites currently, so uh, that's why we teamed up, because I needed someone who is in the know to carry me through the set review, because I knew that all by myself it would have been a botched job. So um, uh, there we are, teaming up and trying to figure out what's going to be good in this format before uh, we got the chance to play with the cards. So yeah, I, absolutely. Neil, yeah. I see we're already butchering it, that's fine. But thank you, Sergevis, for having me on here. Uh, and I did the production will be one set review all by myself. And that was, you know, six hours. And by the end I had no voice. So I figure if we team up, there's a small chance we both have our voices by the end. So I'm very excited about that. Alternatively, we can do 12 hours and then we both lose our voices. Love it. <laughs> also, I will be awake in the morning. Yep. <clears throat> okay. So without further ado. Let's go to the uh, set review rules. Uh, first of all, we decided to evaluate cards based on the previous set game and hand win rates. And this is to say that when we look at a card, we're thinking, okay, what's going to be uh, the win rate of that card across the format? And this makes it slightly different than most set reviews because most set reviews try to evaluate the card in vacuum. Uh, and does a better or worse job at it. And we might as well do a better or worse job at trying to uh, estimate the format. The big difference between it is that we're trying to evaluate what people are going to do with the card, not only how good the card is. I, I gave several cards that I think are good lower grades because I somehow predict that people are going to do a bad job playing them and putting them in decks that they don't, don't have business in being. Uh, and I'm sure that Neil did the same. Um, the only problem I had with this one is that when you look at the sets, their win rates are slightly different in general. So um, what could we do to uh, make them standardized? And what I did was I normalized them so that the average win rate of each set was going to be around 50%, which is uh, neat in one way that I also can say what was the absolutely best card uh, in the last uh, set since mid. Uh, because I have the list of them normalized to 50%. So obviously the one that's going to be on top of there is going to be the best card, uh, the highest win rate card of all, of all the cards. Before you ask, uh, the answer is uh, Sanctuary Warden was actually the best card, the biggest bomb in the, uh, uh, in the last format. So um, that's how we're going to grade them. And based on this normalization, we assign certain percentage uh, 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 brackets as, as grades. And that's what we're going to um, evaluate our cards on. And maybe we can do it one by one. So I do the first one and then you do the second one. So we rest our voices perfectly. So the grade A plus is going to be the absolute uh, ultimate bombs. Only eight cards since mid fit in that bracket. That's the win rate of over 60% in the normalized table, which will be probably around 67 if you don't normalize it. And examples of cards that fit in this bracket was Miglos, Mace Crusher from the uh, last set, or Shieldred, the Apocalypse. At least one of them, because one of them was actually in the A grade, the other one was in the A+, plus because there were two printings of them in the last six sets. All right, so for A's, these are the win rates for 58 to 60% in the normalized data. Examples are Fable of the Mirror Breaker, of course, Absolute Crazy Bomb. Siege Veteran, so we're seeing that in Brothers War, and both being at rare, you get some pretty uh, insane ones in A's, but they're still pretty uncommon. Only 21 cards since mid. So then we have A minus, uh, that's cards between 55 and 58% win rate. There were 77 of those cards, and examples of them were Thrun, uh, Breaker of Silence from the last set. And there was the single common in the A bracket, uh, which was Inspiring Overseer. Uh, clocking in at something over 55% win rate by normalized, which is absolutely meant for a common, but there it is. For B pluses, these are the 535 to 55% range. Examples from one would be Rebel Salvo, the red removal spell, and Evolving Adaptive, the one one that grows. And uh, you know, B pluses, if we're looking at it, these are just the really hyper-efficient cards that maybe don't single-handedly win the game. 
but they can kind of make it like what the game is about if they provide enough, you know, value or tempo quick enough. Uh, just a question from a listener. I'm confused by the win rates. Um, average for 17 lenses around 55.4%. Are you guys weighing to 50%? Yes, we are weighing to 50%. That's why those win rates are lower than you would expect because to compare all those sets with different win rates, we sort of cluster them together at 50% medium win rate um, uh, for the 17 lens users. Um, okay, so Bs will be really, really strong cards uh, between 52.5 and 53.5. These are the cards that you will never cut from your deck. Uh, you will always want to play them. Actually, most of them will be good reasons to start playing the color. And examples are Imperial Oath and Reckless Stormseeker. And then the B minuses, 51 and a half to 52 and a half percent win rate. Examples uh, from Neon Dynasty, we have Kumano faces Kakazan. So just a lot of value for a one drop. You, these are the types of cards that are like pretty efficient uh, and kind of start to draw you into the color, but they're not, you know, bombs. They're still in that B range. Also, Aether Channeler from Dominar United, the uh, Mana War plus a million other abilities that you can choose from. Yeah. Um... Then the next grade is C+, plus, and these are going to be solid playables, cards that you are going to happy to have in your deck. Um, and main difference is, well, except for the win rate, but you can also see in the data that here you will start to have commons as being dominant force. Like in all the previous tiers, it was mainly rares and uncommons. Here, this is the first tier when commons are actually the uh, highest number group of cards uh, in that category. There's 270 of them, and they're between 50 and 51.5%. Um, these are the good commons, the like, better half of them, let's say. Um, and examples are Echo Inspector, Infectious Bite. So, you know, cards you're not like jumping from joy to get, but uh, definitely happy to have you in your deck. And then we have the C grades. Uh, so this is sort of the bread and butter of limited. And I think used to be like, if it's a C, we thought, well, it wasn't very good. But no, in fact, C is sort of the what you kind of expect a lot of your limited deck to make up. And they sort of coalesce to kind of be the driving force of your lanes uh, to, you know, help you win the game. But of course, they're not, you know, busted. They're, they're C commons most of the time. Uh, these have win rates of 49 to 50 percent. Examples are Phalanx Vanguard, the 2-2 two -two Vigilance from Brothers War. And you, it sort of exemplifies, right? It used to, if you just have a 2-2 two -two for two, that's not going to be a C anymore because we're expecting more from our cards. But if you have enough abilities, then it kind of starts to be in that C range. And then Glamour's Outlaw, the uh, Grixis 4-5 from Streets of New Capenna, and one of my personal favorite cards from that set. I was wondering why that one ended up on this slide, but now I know. Uh, C minuses are the cards that are either slightly under par, but still playable, like uh, for example, Air Marshal on the list, uh, that's 48 to 49% win rate, uh, or cards that are probably overplayed in situations where they shouldn't be, but they can be good in some small subset of the games. But um, as a general rule, they, they need higher synergy to be functional, and people put them in the incorrect decks, which lowers their win rate. And here the example will be Icor Plate Golem um, uh, from, uh, from one. Uh, that was probably played slightly too much with decks that didn't have enough oil synergies that dropped the win rate because it was pretty good when you had a lot of oil. For D pluses, these are the cards that they they start to be kind of situational. You can put them in your deck, but you hope you don't have to, or um, you're including them because they have sort of hyper synergy where they're in a specific lane. So examples of these is Rotten Reunion from um, Midnight Hunt where, you know, you can play that if you have enough zombie payoffs, maybe your siege zombie, you start to tap a bunch of your zombies and it's working. Otherwise, the card's pretty bad. Or bring the ending here from one, the counter spell. If you can get corrupted, hey, it's great. But if you can't, probably don't want to put it in your deck. Also, hell of an art from Rotten Union. Um, then we have these. These are between 45 and 47% win rate. These are the cards that you're probably quite unhappy to have in your deck, or at least you should aim at not having any of them, uh, depending on which seat are you in. Um, examples are Gift of Wrath, uh, an aura from uh, Kamigawa Neon Dynasty. Uh, that card was very middling. Um, or Goring Warplow, also another creature that just didn't hit the mark uh, in Brothers War. Um, it was 300 cards in that category since mid. 
And then we have the D minuses. Uh, so these are the cards where, like, they technically can make your deck, but you're really unhappy about it. Um, you know, they're not quite unplayable. But we have two examples from Brothers War, Gixian Skull Flayer, uh, where it required a bunch of effort to start getting counters on it. Um, or Goblin Firebomb. It's like super horrible clunky removal where if you have literally no other way to interact, you're like, well, I guess I got to play this card, but uh, I'm really unhappy about it being in my deck in the first place. So those are D minuses. And the last category, quite small, but quite substantial. And um, uh, these are cards with win rate under 42%. Um, there were 88 cards since mid that fulfilled this category. The examples would be the Grass Unstoppable Juggernaut, 8 mana. That's a bit too much for having uh, impact on the game. Or Goblin Char Belcher, a card that people tried to play and make it great, but uh, it just never was because very often you'll spend 7 mana to do nothing, and that's not what you want to do in this game. Uh, now, of note, this is a category when uh, commons are, again, not common, which is sort of a testament to how good the commons are in the last uh, years. There were very, very few F-grade commons. Most of those cards in this category were uncommon, rare, and higher. So um, uh, the design has changed quite a lot, and that's why we end up with decent and working decks in the rest last years, because there's just no dead unplayable commons ever again. Even the situational one that we play maybe not as much, and we will see that during the review, they try to make them in such a way that uh, you can put them in your best of one deck and they have some kind of emergency rescue fail state um, that is uh, working well. All right. I hope that the next slide is uh, the first evaluation. Now, yes, we start with signposts and our order in the signpost is slightly random. But one thing that we want to give you is A, we give the grades from from the get-go. We're going to talk about the cards when you know our grades, so we spoil the surprise there for you. B, we uh, arrange those rares in two orders that are competing with each other. First of all, if the cards are graded equally by both of us, we put them first. There is not much discussion about those cards because we agree. Um, the longer we go in each color category, the more discrepancy in the grading will be, and hopefully we're going to get some more interesting uh, uh, well, discussions, topic points. Yeah, yeah exactly. And also, like, uh, and the cards where we agree, only one of us is going to tell why they think that this card is a particular grade. As we start diverging, we're going to maybe have a bit of a, a defense on why do you think this is like this and not like the others. And the second order is from the cheapest cards to the more expensive ones, basically. All right. Do you want to start with the Marshal of Zalfir? Yeah, sure. So, um, I guess for those. Uh, seeing this on the video version, they can already see the grades. Um, but what we'll do, should we just read the grades up front because of that for the podcaster listeners too? I guess we could do that too. So yeah. Marshall of Zelfir, uh, this card we both rated B. It's white and a blue for the, a white a white and a blue mana for the uh, white blue signpost in common. Uh, it's a 2-2 two -two human knight, and it says other knights you control get plus one, plus one. And it also has the activated ability, uh, white and a blue and tap it to tap another target creature. Uh, so if we think about like these bees pulling you into a color, uh, it's very clear what white blue wants to be about in the set. It's a knight. You want to have other knights. And then also this tap ability allows you to basically keep being aggressive because that's kind of what these, this white blue pair wants to be. But also if you know you happen to be a, a little bit behind, you can go ahead and use the ability to just kind of stay in the game uh, and, until you can deploy more knights. So we both kind of put it as a B for that reason. Yep, I totally agree with that. Um, next one is Invasion of Xerex. Uh, this is a, a battle. Um, it costs four mana, two white and blue. Um, as every, I'm going to read the first battle rule um, because it's the first one we're doing. I'm not going to. We're not going to do it for the other ones. But uh, as Siege enters, choose an opponent to protect it. You and other uh, players can attack it. When it's defeated, exile it. Then cast it transformed. So first of all, you cast it, you control it all the time, but you select the player to defend it. They have to defend it. You can attack it. It has X life, uh, and you can see how much life each of them has in the bottom corner. And then uh, once this number goes to zero, it, um, it exiles, and then you cast the backside of that spell 
um, of, of that permanent um, uh, separately. So think about it. Uh, if someone defeats a battle, you can counter the thing that comes after uh, after it, which is important to know. And it usually has an ability on the first side um, that does something that is, in most cases, slightly overcosted. And on the back side, it has either a permanent or a spell, sometimes a planeswalker, sometimes a sorcery, there's some equipment, uh, so different things. Uh, and then you, you defeat it, and you basically can cast the back side for free, so you get this extra value from the, uh, from the spell that you otherwise wouldn't. Um, so Invasion of Xerex is uh, two white, blue for a battle siege with four defense counters when it enters the battlefield. And when it enters the battlefield, you return up to one target creature to its owner hand. So uh, that's basically an unsummon on the stick. Then if you defeat it, it flips into a flying creature that has power and toughness equal to the number of creatures you control. So at minimum, it's a 1-1. One, one. Um, uh, but obviously there is no ceiling. If you have infinite creatures, it will be infinite, infinite. Um, I gave it a B minus and so did uh, Neil. Um, I think it's a good battle in a way that it enables you to flipping it very uh, easily once you play it. You can imagine situations that uh, an opponent leaves one blocker behind, you play the invasion of Xerex, uh, you bounce the blocker, you attack with your creatures into the battle and you gain, uh, a, let's say a 3-3 three, three flyer or a 4-4 four, four flyer, depending on how many creatures you had. Uh, so uh, I think that this is because it's easier to flip and because it, I think, plays well with the uh, theme of the color combination and because people will not have, will, will basically have it very difficult to put it in the wrong deck because that's what blue-white seems to be doing, tempo kind of aggressive kind of gameplay. Um, I think that the card will have a high win rate, so I gave it a B-. minus. All right, our next one is another battle. This is uh, black red for uh, a battle at Uncommon. Uh, and it says, when in oh, sorry, I should name, I should probably tell you what the card is uh, Invasion of Asgul. <laughs> so, Invasion of Asgul, when it enters the battlefield, target player sacrifices a creature or planeswalker and loses one life. It has four defense. Uh, and then the backside is Ashen Reaper. It's a zombie elemental and it has menace. Um, it's a 2 1. And it says, at the beginning of your end step, put a plus one, plus one counter on Ashen Reaper if a permanent was put into a graveyard from the battlefield this turn. Uh, so we both gave it a C plus. Um, it didn't quite reach that B level because while it does kind of have some of the same play patterns as the last battle, you can't really have that much control because your opponent gets to sacrifice whatever they want. So maybe if they have a tap creature, they sacrifice that. You don't have the attacks to set it up. Um, additionally, while it is very cheap, that's kind of the developing stage of the game. So you're not going to get that much value. You know, you play it on turn two, maybe you get your opponents two drop most of the time. So you're pretty even on exchanges there. And then after you go through the hoops of attacking it later on, you get a two, one menace, maybe a three, two, uh, immediately. So, I mean, the card is not bad. It, it will kind of pull its weight, uh, in sort of this color pair being kind of black, red, aggressive but it's nothing uh, substantial. And I think we're going to see uh, a lot of this where exactly as Sirkovitz was saying, when the battle helps you kind of flip it on its own, those battles are often going to be kind of in the B range at least um, because it will be much easier to flip them. If that's not the case, usually they're going to be more like in the C range or some of them are actually just quite bad. So we'll see more of that as we go along. Uh, yep. Yep. Okay, so um, the next is a signpost uncommon for the is it Joyful Storm Sculptor. That's a three blue and a red creature human shaman. When it enters the battlefield, create two one one blue and red elemental creature tokens. Whenever you cast a spell that has convoked Joyful Storm Sculptor, deals one damage to each opponent and each battle they protect. It's an interesting card. Um, five mana for four or five power across three bodies, which goes well with the blue reds convoke theme so in this set uh, blues main mechanic is convoke so you can tap creatures to help casting spells interestingly enough uh, a good number of those spells uh, are instants so you can basically sit with your board open at the end of their turn you can tap several creatures and cast a spell for free uh, and you can use the mana to cast other spells that uh, will allow you to survive uh, that don't have convoke uh, discard looks nice i don't know exactly how good this um archetype is going to be but in the end it's a five mana four five uh even with those three bodies 
I don't think it's going to be much higher than uh, a C plus in my estimation. But it's still a good card that you definitely want to play. It might turn out to be better if um, if we actually uh, if the archetype itself is going to be stronger than I perceive, and that's basically it. All right, for the Boros signpost on common here, we have Invasion of Kylem. So, you know, I'm getting to read all these double-sided cards, boards for me. It's uh, two red-white, uh, and it says, when Invasion of Kylem enters the battlefield, up to two target creatures each get plus two, plus zero, and gain Vigilance and Haste until end of turn, and it has five defense. On the back side, you've got Valor's Reach Tag Team, which is a sorcery, and it says, create two, three, two red and white warrior creature tokens with whenever this creature and at least one other creature token attack, put a plus one, plus one counter on this creature. So really kind of an interesting one here. Um, first off, having five defense is higher than we've seen in the other cards. Uh, so it's a little bit harder to flip. It's a little bit on, more on the expensive side. You kind of already have to have a board for it to do anything, right? Because you're trying to pump up your creatures to be able to attack past, which theoretically should help you flip the invasion of Kylum. The problem is, the card doesn't give any defense. So if the board is kind of at parity anyways, you play this, you're still at parity and you can't punch through necessarily unless it enables really good attacks. But then maybe your opponent's still trading with you because you don't have any defense there. Um, and so it's not really helping you to flip the invasion unless you have, you know, evasive creatures in play already. The vigilance and haste is nice as well. Although how often are you going to play something and this in the same turn to take advantage of the haste? Probably not too often. Now, the backside is very real, right? Getting basically four mana to eventually put th two three twos in play that when they both attack, they both become four threes immediately. And then as the game goes on, might get better than that is pretty incredible. So if you ever, you know, you're curving out two drop, three drop and your opponent's, you know, first play was a three drop, um, then they're going to be in a lot of trouble here because you might flip it very quickly and you're just going to steamroll your opponent from there. But that's kind of um, more of the win more scenario. So all that said, putting it together, we both rated this a C minus. Uh, oh, here we have our first uh, slight differences. Uh, this is the Invasion of Ergamon. That's the Gru one. It costs red and a green. It's a battle siege with five defense. When Invasion of Ergamon enters the battlefield, create a treasure token. Then you may discard a card if you do draw a card. And it flips if you get rid of those five defense counters into a 3-4 trample creature. And when Truga Cliff Charger, which is the name of it, enters the battlefield, you may discard a card. If you do, search your library for a land or battle card, reveal it, put it into your hand, and then shuffle. Now, I gave this card a C+, plus, but um, actually, I think it's a pretty decent card. I mean, my, my argument is that the first half is basically the first... The, the poorer version, the poor, poor person's version of the first two chapter of uh, Fable of the Mirror Breaker. You get a treasure, you discard a card and draw a card. So that's basically what the uh, Kikijiki Saga does. Then if you flip it, you flip it to a 3-4 Trampler. And if you flip it uh, with some plan in hand, um, you can also discard a, a land and get a battle, which is useful because the gruel theme is actually attacking battles. So you want to get as many of those battles in your deck as possible. And also your creatures are particularly equipped well to uh, deal with battles because they get variety of bonuses when attacking a battle. So you want uh, to have more battles on the board because your creatures will be stronger and you can uh, increase your board, get those extra, uh, extra values. I think it's a pretty solid card. Um, Neil gave it a B plus, B minus, and I think that this is uh, difference is by a whisker, really. And I would, I, I would be very easily convinced that it's also a B minus. Yeah, so it's it's just exactly what you're saying here. The only thing, the only reason I rated it a little higher was I think the treasure token is a lot because it accelerates you to get ahead to be able to actually flip the battle. So when we talk about you know it enabling those attacks, like for example, there's a four mana uh, red. I believe it's a common. Um, it's a, like a four three menace, but if it attacks a battle, you double its power. So you could play that on turn three. They can't really block at the following turn. So maybe on turn four, you could flip this battle and suddenly you have like a four, three menace and a three, four trample and your opponent's like, this sucks. And then you win. So yeah, I could see that happening. I could definitely see that happening. I mean, this card is obviously going to be one of the cards that will have a much stronger opening hand win rate um, because if you play it on turn two, that's actually a pretty strong play. Um, right. All right, so our next, we have uh, a the blue-green signpost uncommon. It's Invasion of Pyrulia. 
and it says whenever uh, this enters the battlefield, scry three, then reveal the top card of your library. If it's a land or double face card, draw a card. So usually you're going to get a, the card back immediately. It has four defense. And then the backside uh, is gargantuan slab horn. It's a four, four beast with trample and ward two. And it says other transform permanents you control have trample and ward two. So that signpost pointing to like you want to transform as much stuff as possible and have all these crazy transformations. Now, it is kind of interesting because if that's the theme and you have like one slot per pack for the transform cards, it means every draft has a set number of the 24 transform cards. So how many of you of those are you actually going to end up with um, having that theme be much more at the uncommon level? It's a little bit suspect for me. Um, that being said, um, you know, this is a two mana card again, eventually turning into a four, four it, trample War two is a huge creature. You do get the card back immediately. Um, it doesn't really help you flip it. Um, so again, if I think about maybe not being quite in the B range for that, um, but we had a little bit of a discrepancy here. I gave this a C plus because I think, um, it's just going to pay you off eventually to be able to get this creature. Maybe blue has some flying to be able to attack the battle. Zero bit said C. I think we're probably saying similar things here. Yeah, I think that, yeah. Uh, I mean, also battles are counted as I think as transformed uh, on the backside. Yeah, yeah. So this will give your other transformed battles. Uh, but also there are transformed creatures, like normal transformed creatures. And the green has quite a number also of those incubate tokens. So I think that there is more that it will give the bonuses to. I'm just undermining my own argument here. I think that it's just... I don't know how well equipped the blue green deck is going to be in attacking a battle. And I think that two mana for scrying three, which I would say... Is a good effect, and then drawing a card uh, probably good eighty percent of the time. I don't know if it's just enough for that. Um, oh, so the next one we have is Invasion of New Capena. Uh, that costs white and black. is a battle. It has four defense, and when Invasion of New Capena enters the battlefield, you may sacrifice an artifact or creature. When you do exile target artifact or creature and opponent control. So uh, that's um, basically the same as the thing from, was it Midnight Hunt? That had flashback? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That card was nice. Exactly. The, the right um, of this or yeah. that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right of something. That, uh, that That's my knowledite of the card. Oblivion. Right of oh, Oblivion. rights of Oblivion. There we go. Um, I think that. First of all, let's let's not look at the backside. But first of all, uh, this archetype wants to sacrifice things. There's plenty of cards that have synergies when you sacrifice something. There's plenty of cards that are very good sacrifice fodder. And then it has only four defense. When you flip it, uh, it becomes an equipment that has equip one. And it's a very strange equipment, I have to say. It's like one of the weirdest equipment that I've ever seen. It has, whenever equipped creature attacks, put a plus one, plus one counter on that creature and each other creature you control that shares a creature type with it. Now, obviously, the shtick of white-black is Phyrexians, and uh, you want to play it in the deck that is heavy in Phyrexians, but it might mean that you equip it for one on any creature that you control, attack, and all your creatures get permanent bonuses, so it's not really dependent on Holy Frazzle Cannon to be destroyed. Those counters will stay on them, and, of course, the more times you attack, the, the more it, um, uh, the more it um, uh, snowballs. I gave it a B. I think uh, the ability to kill anything is a really strong one. Uh, your ability to generate multiple bodies, also the ability to sacrifice artifacts where you can actually sacrifice an incubate uh, token before you uh, flip it. Um, and those incubate tokens tokens are added to many things for, for relatively cheap price um, is a neat thing. And also the ability of the equipment, if you have a heavy, uh, heavily Phyrexian deck, is going to be good. And because this is a card exactly in the color of the most Phyrexians, people are going to be prevented from putting it in the wrong deck very often. And that's why I think the win rate is going to be relatively high on this one. Yeah, I think you might be right on that one. I'm being, I was slightly lower. I hadn't really considered as much the angle of maybe you're not losing as much as your opponent. Obviously, if you have a weaker creature you're sacrificing, then you know you get their big bomb. But if you had like an incubate one just sitting there, then you're almost kind of getting like, um a one for zero right that flips into something real i was a little bit lower on the backside just because it is slow even though it's powerful because you have to wait a whole nother turn cycle to do anything because it only works on attacks but if you have enough you know phyrexians even if you're only getting the one counter like that is a very powerful effect so i mean for two mana 
I mean, this could easily be a B, um, but it's definitely a really, really strong card. All right, our next, we have a uh, another, we, so every, there's two sign on post uh, uncommons in every color, I believe. This one is the, another one of the red, white sign post uncommons. It's a mirror shield hoplite. It's a 2-2 human soldier. It has vigilance and it says, whenever a creature you control becomes the target of a backup ability, copy that ability, you may choose new targets for the copy. This ability triggers only once each turn. So in classic awkward fashion, we actually haven't read, read any cards with backup yet. Um, but backup is an ability in this set. Uh, it's kind of a really cool, weird new ability that allows you to copy the abilities of a creature for a single turn. Um, so maybe we can go to a card with backup just so I can... Uh... I'm just going to scroll through uh, to, to see something with backup in the in, from the future. Yeah, so back ah, there we go. here, for example, there's a white common later, Sigil the Sentinel. It's a three mana, two, two, but it has backup one. And so backup reads, when this creature enters the battlefield, put a plus one, plus one counter on target creature. If that's another creature, it gains the following ability till end of turn. So everything that follows the backup ability, another creature can get it temporarily, or you could just put the counter on the creature as it comes in, uh, and it just obviously boosts it because it has a plus one, plus one counter. So all the backup abilities are the creature is always going to look a little bit weaker because it's coming with a plus one plus one counter attached but also they change the way that combat is going to happen on that turn because they're going to grant all of their abilities to whatever other creature um and so it's really this interesting like dynamic gameplay because you can go on to any creature on your side so i'm very excited for that um so if in the example of sigiled sentinel its back ability grants the vigilance to something else i mean that's not going to be incredible but if we go back to our red white signpost on common on you it, are copying on it, on it on it there we go <laughs> you are copying the entire ability uh, and you can choose new targets for the copy so at a minimum um at least my understanding of how this works is that uh you know both those creatures are going to have plus one plus one counter so yeah. if you are you know curving this into a backup creature on the next turn those creatures are already pretty much at rate because they come with that counter and now suddenly you're getting an extra one um, so this card just seems like it can snowball incredibly quickly. And again, we have these like red, white, you know, de facto aggro strategies, which have been the best, if not, you know, the top three best uh, color pair over the last several sets. And, and part of the reason it's, it's if you put red and white cards together, they tend to just be really deep commons at or deep roster at common. Uh, and it always just kind of works. And this seems like it's not going to be hard because there's a ton of backup even at common. Uh, itself. So I'm pretty high on the mirror shield hoplite. I gave it a B for that reason. And secrets, you were saying B minus. I mean, I, you think the card is good too, but I mean, I, 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 after rethinking, I'm pretty sure that your grade is probably closer to the truth. I think that at least in the first weeks, red, white is going to be one of the stronger decks because backup is a very easy to understand mechanic. Uh, also pretty powerful one and also fits best of one as well, because it's pretty aggressive and also Lots of things have vigilance as well, so it plays well with defending battles, attacking battles. So yeah, I mean, um, I really like Mirror Shield Hoplite. I gave it a B minus, but you know, the difference between B minus and B in our grading is very, very minor. So it's just like a one percentage point difference between the win rates of the normalized things that we decided to. Um, okay, so here we have another battle. This time I have to read a lot of words. Invasion of Moag, that's two green-white for a battle siege. It has five defense. When it enters the battlefield, you put a plus one, plus one counter on each creature you control. And if you if you win the battle, you get a 3-3 three, three creature with ward two that has, at the beginning of your end step, put a plus one, plus one counter on target creature you control. Now, first of all, there is a white-green, hello, Mr. Cat. What, why are you bothering me? Please go away. <laughs> Thank you. Um, white green uh, has a theme of plus one, plus one counter. So putting a plus one, plus one counter on uh, a creature uh, can mean much more than, uh, than than it says on the tin. Because there are some cards that put additional counters. Uh, there are some cards that get bonuses from the counters and so on and so on. So first of all, the first ability of the battle is quite strong. Second of all, the first ability of the battle uh, lets you win it because your creatures become bigger, so it opens new attacks. It, it helps you to uh, deal this five damage to the battle. And the backside is really strong because when you think about it, it's a version of Luminarch Aspirant. 
um, neatly put on the uh, end step because uh, you won't get it active probably before your attacks uh, on the first turn it flips because you probably will flip it because of attacking. Uh, so it instantly gives you one extra counter, which again can mean multiple counters depending on what creatures you have on board uh, in this um, archetype. So I put it on a B, you put it on a B minus. I think that these are again, very close grades and I don't think that there is a much difference in how we see the card. Yeah, not too much difference. I mean, I think you're probably closer to the truth. It's probably more like a B. Um, if we think about the card, it's like busted at parity and ahead, right? Because you instantly flip it and you probably win that game, which probably means it probably should be a B. I think you're probably right. Uh, these types of cards, I'm a little bit worried about some of the battles in the aspect, like if you're already losing and then you can't attack as well. Like you could imagine your opponent has a couple of creatures and like you play this and you have like one creature. You, there you'd much just rather have like any creature to add to the board because you get a counter, but you can't even really attack. and if you aren't able to flip some of these battles to the backside, I think it's just something we've never played with battles before. So any time we have a new card type, we have to kind of envision how it's going to work. Like when we first were on Lorwyn and the Planeswalkers were first printed, we're like, this is wild, like what's going on? And obviously we can use some of that knowledge to apply that to battles. Um, but if your opponent is able to set up the defenses, we are not able to flip the battles. Obviously they get a ton worse, but it, it I mean... We'll talk about it much more over the course of time when we think about battles and how they're going to play out. But you do kind of have to play a little bit more defensively anyways, because if your opponent slams a battle and then instantly flips it, you're massively behind. And if that ends up being the case, boards are going to stall out more, which is actually going to make this card a lot better. So I do agree kind of where you're saying, like, if the board is often at parity, this is a B and then it pulls you ahead. Um, but it's just a, a lot going on in terms of how we think about how this is all going to, uh, you know, work. So really cool card. Sorry, that was a lot of words for not having much to say. <laughs> well, now you can say a lot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So our next one is uh, the next red-green signpost. It's Rampaging Geoderm. Uh, it's a 3-3 dinosaur beast and has Trample and Haste. Uh, and it says whenever you attack, target attacking creature gets plus one, plus one until in a turn. If it's an attacking a battle... Put a plus one plus one counter on it instead um i mean this card just comes down and hits really hard it also can uh put the counter on itself um and so you know if you didn't have good attacks before this is almost always going to give them to you and i'm i'm thinking my grade is too low right now but i gave it a b minus uh you gave it a b uh Sirkovitz. i think you're probably right actually on this one because i'm imagining the other red green uncommon into this one where it oh, had God, five indeed. defense that's and then you, you ramp it up ramp this out on turn uh three and then you attack it you put a counter and then if it's attacking a battle, so you put another counter, it instantly flips, and now you have a 5-5 five, five trample haste and a 3-4 that you discard a card and you go get your other battle because you were in the red-green lane. No one else wanted these battles. And, well, that's disgusting. <laughs> yeah, I've actually I started thinking because I also have the skeleton stream coming up, and I'm pretty sure that the red-green, if it has enough this battle-killing synergies, you can actually splash some battles out of the... Uh, out of those oh, treasure oh, oh. i misread the card hold on um it gets plus one plus one but if it's attacking a battle you get a counter yeah, on yeah. It instead yeah, yeah not two counters okay never mind never mind um yeah no i, th I think this card's probably closer to b minus then i well i, I, read I, I still think i still think if, if if you play it right you get an instantly a four four haste and that's i mean it's yeah that's still busted that's that's busted and the fact that you can distribute those counters across other creatures you can grow something smaller i think it's it's going to be pretty pretty strong yeah anyway perfect. Uh, okay, I have Halo Forager, uh, one blue-black, uh, creature fairy rogue, 3-1, flying. That's a good stat line already for me. That's like a C-plus on its own um, as a 3-1 flyer uh, for three. Mana requirement is slightly high, but it has another ability. When Halo Forager enters the battlefield, you may pay X. When you do, you may cast target instant or sorcery card with mana value X from a graveyard, which means any graveyard, uh, with mana value X Oh, uh, yeah, without paying its mana cost. If that spell would be put into a graveyard, exile it instead. Now, this has two things going on for it. Like, first of all, it's a good creature on raid. It's evasive, so it can help you win some battles as well because it won't be blocked that easily. Um, if you draw it in a late game, you can play it for seven mana and you can get like a four mana spell out of the graveyard uh, for free. So you draw it, you cast it for, for the totality of, uh, of, of how much it costs, which is a good deal. 
And also, uh, blue black has this sub theme of milling you and the opponent. So it means it will be pretty good in filling those graveyards because the main problem with cards like this is very often you have them, you have enough mana, but there's just nothing in the graveyards that you might be able to play. Because you will probably mill you and the opponent a couple of times, you'll have at least some selection of what you want to play for it. I gave it a B minus. Uh, you gave it a B. I think that these are, again, very similar grades. There is no discussion that the card is going to be decent. Yeah, my only quick word of note, we don't have to belabor it too long, is that uh, I think just flying makes cards a little bit better in the set because of the existence of battles. So that's really all. Agreed. All right, our next one, Sculpted Perfection, another white-black signpost on common. This is two white-black for an enchantment. It says, when Sculpted Perfection enters the battlefield, incubate two. Uh, so this is our first instance of incubate. It says, create an incubator token with two plus one plus one counters on it, and it has two to transform this artifact. It transforms into a zero zero Perfection artifact creature. So this comes in, it makes an artifact token. Uh, it puts two counters on it. When you pay two at some point in the game, it flips over, you have a two two. Ah, there's more. So this enchantment says Phyrexians you control get plus one, plus one. So really that 2-2 two, is going to become a 3-3. Three, three. Um, and so the whole trick with these uh, Incubate tokens is if you have enough time, you can sort of amass this army and win sort of this sort of grindy long game uh, with it. And so there's this whole kind of cycle of these Phyrexian enchantments, which is kind of cool. That being said, it's a lot of mana because you're paying four mana up front for kind of nothing unless you already have some Phyrexians in play. And so for that reason, I gave this a C. You gave it a C plus, but it's probably just like depending on the board states, how good this card is. Yeah, I think that uh, I, I like how you sn snuck in the MS the army into the sentence. Very well done. Very well done. Different mechanic, different set, but same uh, same idea with the uh, incubators. Um, I put it on C plus mainly because it is a two color card, so I think it more often than not will be put in the correct deck because there are just the density of Phyrexians in white and black is higher. And then people uh, will have less possibility of misplaying it by putting it in a deck with four Phyrexians. And I think that, yes, you, you have a good point of the card not doing much if you don't have the creatures on board. But if you do a you know, two-drop uh, Phyrexian, three-drop Phyrexian, this, and then flip, then it works sort of like the Invasion of Moab that stays on board and, and pumps your cards that uh, appear on the board slightly later, which I think is a decent ability. So, yeah. Yeah, it's interesting because you're going to have those games where this card is going to be like a B, B plus level card. And then you're going to have those games where you have nothing in play and it's going to be like a D or D minus. So uh, going to huge variance on this one. Okay. Um, Invasion of Lorwyn. Uh, that's a four black green uh, battle with five defense. So six mana. That's quite a lot, so it better do something useful. Uh, when Invasion of Lorwyn enters the battlefield, destroy target non-elf creature and opponent controls with power X or less, where X is the number of lands you control. Hopefully, unless they have some weird Galta or whatnot, uh, this can kill almost any creature uh, that is on board. I actually didn't do stats how many elves we have in the set, but uh, I don't think that many. Um, and... If you manage to uh, get the five defense, um, it becomes a Winnowing Forces, which is um, an XX creature, and power and toughness of this creature are each equal to the number of lands you control. So basically, if you flip it, you get a really big but really dumb beast uh, that doesn't do much. So um, it's easily chumpable, but the size of it will be probably 7, 7, 8, 8, which makes it something that you need to uh, reckon with. And Against some colors, there is not so much to the removal that can deal with something with seven toughness. So that's uh, worth to know that if you manage to flip it against some decks, that's uh, almost a one game. I gave it a B minus. You gave it a B. Again, we're sort of oscillating around the same grade. And I think that uh, the changes between uh, whether it's a B minus or B will slightly depend on the power of the archetype itself. Yeah, pretty much black green is always kind of like it does something, something good. And in this case, we'll see. Um, I just imagine like those scenarios where it's like you're going to get a 6-6 six, six or 7-7 seven, seven right away. Like 6-6 six, six, Ravenous Chupacabra is, seems completely bananas, but... Well, 6-6 six, sometimes... six, Ravenous Chupacabra opponent gains 5, but... Yeah, yeah. But uh, that's that's always not always going to be the case. 
All right, our next signpost on common, we're really starting to uh, kind of diverge here. We disagree on this one a little bit, but it'll be interesting to see. Uh, this is a green white one. Uh, it says it's caused green and white for botanical brawler. It's a zero zero elemental warrior. It has trample, but it comes into play with two plus one plus one counters. So a two mana two two trample. But it says whenever one or more plus one plus one counters are put on another permanent you control, if it's the first time plus one plus one counters have been put on that permanent this turn, put a plus one plus one counter on botanical brawler. Um, so this one's really interesting because uh, in the right curve out scenarios, the card is incredibly powerful, um, but it only kind of grows itself. So a lot of these cards where we saw a lot of flexibility for them to be really powerful uh, is kind of what lends it to being some of, somewhat of that better grade. Um, I was sort of saying here, this is a C plus. You were saying B. I can imagine scenarios where, and it's probably not that hard to put together, where you play this, maybe you play a backup creature, you put the counter on the backup creature itself, it's going to put a counter on the botanical brawler, and then all of a sudden you have a two mana three three. But I think a two mana three three trample, while being very good, requires a lot of setup cost in the sense that you do actually have to do that. And um, we're sort of past the point where that itself is maybe being at the B level. However, if you do a couple things uh, and you get this to be a four four or bigger for two mana, it's actually pretty incredible. And green-white might be this type of uh, strategy where you are trying to sort of just build the board and not trade. Uh, because if you get the creatures to start to be big enough, then your opponent can't attack you. And uh, if you kind of just build out the board, you have more time to build up the counters and eventually just the, it's insurmountable. So I almost see this more as, well, it costs two mana and you want to get the ball rolling. It's much more of like this mid-range thing, which goes with the invasion of Moag, which was the other green-white flip thing and puts all the counters everywhere. And if you put counters everywhere, then you're also going to be putting them on the Botanical Brawler. But you can't necessarily combo off with it because it is limited to that once per turn. So there's a lot of restrictions. Uh, if you jump through all those hoops, this card can be incredible. Sometimes it's going to be a two mana 2-2, two -two, which is obviously very bad. That would be like a, a D-plus level card. Uh, so I don't know. I don't know where the truth lies here, but you were thinking maybe this will be a B. Was it for those like when it goes well kind of situations? I've, I have to, I have to admit, I have to confess. I am an, I love my counters, uh, plus one, plus one counter synergy cards in white, blue, I mean, white, green. I mean, I, it's my, it's my, it's my personal hobby to build rubbish decks with, um, uh, with, with plus one, plus one counters and pride Malkin always somehow. Um, but this card, this card has slightly more to it, I think. Like, for example, it does it only once a turn for each permanent that gets a plus one, plus one count. Yeah, I misread. Uh, I think Old Timer pointed out you're right. Um, so, my bad. So it does make it better. So if you have three creatures, you play an in Invasion of Moab, it will get two additional plus one, plus one counters. I think that also, like, a dream curve out of Botanical Brawler on turn two into Botanical Brawler on turn three is uh, in into something that puts counters and with backup uh, is going to be is going to be somewhat achievable. Um, so yeah, I think that the card has explosive potential. I think that on its own, it is supported because there is plenty of cards that uh, work with it. There is, again, the invasion that we showed. There is the uh, uh, seed core card that uh, gives four plus one plus one counter that you can distribute as you want. Um, there is, again, uh, it says permanent. So incubate um, uh, tokens also count for that. And there's some of them in white and some of them in green, which will be able to uh, sort of pivot from Phyrexian into plus one, plus one counters. I think all in all, it's also a cheap card, which is always good because you want to have explosive starts relatively early. Um, and I gave it a B, probably it's a B minus or something, but I'm, I'm pretty I'm pretty sure that the card is going to be relatively strong because I think that the archetype is supported. Yeah, you convinced me. I'll come up to B minus on that. All right, uh, I have Stormclaw Rager. Uh, it's one black red, ogre warrior, two, two, uh, one mana and sacrifice another creature or artifact, plus put a plus one, plus one counter on Stormcrow Rager and draw a card, activate only as a sorcery. Now this card, yes, the activation as a sorcery is a bit annoying, but being able to sacrifice whatever you want and, uh, draw a card uh, in a deck that will generate a lot of stuff that can be easily sacrificed because I think Raptus has a lot of sacrifice outlets and a lot of generators of um, of cheap value, um, and lots of cards that can generate multiple rectangles, multiple pieces of cardboard on your board. I think that it's just going to be enough to make this card pretty decent. I put it at B minus. You put it at C. I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if it plays out as a C plus, but it will slightly depend on how strong the archetype is. And I think that uh, 
this is what hangs what 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 it hangs on um, uh, in balance. Yeah, I put it this at C because I think I just made the mistake of you know overrating cards with effects, especially after Fractal B one, because I think you know a three mana two two these days is just a horrible card. Now, obviously, this is much better than a three mana two two because it has all these abilities. It can grow. It does all these other things, but. You need extra mana for it. You need a board state where you want to grow it. You need random, you know, artifacts and creatures lying around, which we've talked about. Like, that's going to build up over time. So that can work. Um, and so I think you can put a lot of work in to get it to that C-plus level. But I think it's difficult because you have to have the draft go a certain way. Uh, there's a threaten effect in the format, but it's uncommon, which makes me kind of more hesitant about this card. Um, although if there's enough, you know, of that support, the threat itself might be a pretty good card uh, in red-black. And uh, I just think, you know, these types of cards, like if this came in, if it was a three mana three, three with this ability, suddenly now we're talking and I wouldn't have been shocked if it was because they're really pushing uh, the power and toughness these days. Um, but I, I also think you're right that you can build sort of these decks where you um, can generate a lot of value. Like if you can play the uh, card we'll talk about later, which brings multiple cards back from the graveyard and you're sacrificing it and there's like a drain package where multiple cards are making your opponent lose two life, you gain two life, and you rinse, repeat, and you're... Like, this card could be a whole engine. I just think it's almost more of an enchantment than a creature, and because of mm. that, I sort of have it at the sea level. I always hate it when they put a good enchantment effect on the creature, because then it just becomes so much they can easier kill it. to kill. <laughs> um, but also, I mean, I would say that this card, I wouldn't treat it as a curve out turn three play. I would treat it more like a five drop, that uh, I want to build up to it, play it on turn five, and then get a couple of cards instantly from the stuff that I don't want to use anymore. True, yeah. yeah. Um... All right, I have the next one here. It's a blue-green signpost. It's Mutagen Connoisseur. It's one green-blue for a 0-5 Vidalcan Mutant. It has Flying and Vigilance, and it gets plus one, plus zero oh for each transformed permanent you control. Um, so we did talk about, you know, there's the Incubator or Incubation Phyrexian uh, tokens. We have also the entire flip sheet. Um, but again, I, I don't think this card is incredible because it's a lot of work to give it any power at all, which is really just a no-no. That's just pretty bad. But it also is really hard to kill. Having five toughness means it can block all day and it has vigilance. So once you do start to give it power, if your opponent doesn't have flyers, you can attack a block pretty safely with this card. Even getting it to two power is pretty nice because your opponent can't attack with a swarm of two twos. Um, and being able to vigilance, I think, as, as a mechanic is the best it's ever been, right? Because you can attack and you can defend your battles uh, in this set. And so if you get this to be a 2-5, which I think if the whole color pair is looking to do that, you're getting a pretty good deal out of this card. And so that's why I gave it a C plus. You know, you gave this a C minus Sirkovitz, which I can respect because I don't think the card's incredible. Um, and it does require work for that reason. Um, but... Again, I kind of give that bonus for the flying, the vigilance. I think these keywords are just fantastic. So, but yeah, not not an incredible card by any means. So yeah, I mean, I'm, maybe I was a bit burned by the white blue archetype from one when the signpost uncommon was really similar, but one mana more expensive, which is important, but also much easier to make it into high power. And still, I think I th you 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 were always feeling that this fake fake security when you played it and you had this five toughness creature, but somehow the opponents always managed to kill multiple copies of it in one turn uh, when I was playing them. So that's maybe why I'm burned a bit by that. Um, but yeah, five toughness is good, uh, not my style of deck. And I think that those decks are going to be also pretty hard to play, I think. And because of that, I'm betting on the win rate of the card being slightly lower because um, Again, we're judging it based on where we predict the win rate is going to be, not how strong the card we're predicting it to be. So it has to take into account the mistakes that people are going to be making with those kind of cards. And that's why yeah. I put it in C-. Yeah, and you also bring up a good... Well, you kind of bring up this good point that like the card itself doesn't actually contribute to being able to build out the board. Because if you think of battles, if you play a battle, and this is an 05 at the time, it's not going to attack into the battle. So you kind of need to already have some transformations to be able to take advantage of the fact that it's a flying attacker for the battles. So maybe it's a little bit more than I was giving it credit for, and you might be it might be more like a C. We'll see. Okay. Uh, oh, that, that's, that, that's the biggest uh, difference that we have. Um, invasion of Kaladesh. Blue-red for battle. Uh, 
When it enters the battlefield, create a 1-1 one, one colorless stop their artifact creature token with flying. It has four defense. And it flips into uh, a vehicle that is flying. Its power is equal to the number of artifacts you control. So at least one and maybe two when you have the topter. And it has crew one. Uh, you gave it B minus. I gave it a D plus. OK, so I'm going to first do uh, my part. I think that A, blue and red don't have a lot of incubate um, uh, ability. And the rest of the artifacts are sort of rubbish in the set, unless you go like super high rarity. So this at best will be like a 1424 four flyer. I'm not impressed by that. And uh, playing two mana with colors that are, you know, like it's a higher requirement. Um, to get a 1-1 one, one Thopter is just not enough for me. So I think that this card is going to be playing relatively poorly because you won't be living the dream of, of, of having this like 6-4 uh, attacker, for example, unless you play it in some kind of really weird deck, which will happen rarely, which would mean that the win rate of it is going to be more or as, as a two mana thing that if you invest some attacks into it, will flip into a, a one four vehicle with crew one. Yeah, I think that that all makes sense. And I agree with you. The biggest strike against this is not really what blue red is doing, right? Blue red is much more on the like convoking side of things, I think, where it's, you're getting the creatures out and you're trying to have tokens and things. So while this is a token and helps with the convoke plan, the artifacts, I agree, they're kind of bad in the set, but maybe some of the bad ones do actually end up being good enough if you have this plus some other effects in blue and red. We'll see about that. But I also think that if you can get the first flyer in play, then this already starts to kind of chip away at the damage. Um, so you could imagine by maybe turn five, this could flip. Mm -hmm. And then it plays defense incredibly well because you have the four four defense, you know, flyer versus other things. Um, but if you have, you know, some random backup cards where you turn the flyer now into a 2-2 two -two and it's already sitting in play, that's kind of nice. You can also use it for the blue-red convoke theme. So you're not really overpaying for the 1-1 one -one flyer that much. Um, and it just kind of sits there and eventually maybe you get this star four. Um, I just think you're getting a pretty good deal for two mana out of the card. Like you're again, you're getting a lot of pieces of cardboard for not very much. Now, are any of those single pieces of cardboard that particularly good? Maybe not. Um, but I think again, like having that flying, having all these abilities is kind of nice. And I think if you just, I think I'm not thinking this card as being like ever going to be a six, four flyer or whatever, but if it, if you keep the thought during play and it's a two, four, like that's super good for two mana. Um, but it's it's not a super fast flip and it's not really a game plan all on its own. It's just like a good magic card. Yeah. Yeah. Again, another thing that I think might be problematic for blue red is how to flip it. And and yeah. like I'm worried that blue red might be playing a plan when when you are able to flip it, you might as well kill the opponent and, and save yourself the effort. Because um you're probably I, I what how I see blue red in this format so far is this is a deck that starts pretty defensively plays lots of those convoke control spells starts accruing card value and overwhelms with the value uh, later in the game and then i don't just know if you care enough for um um for doing this however on the defense i think that there there might be a plan that involves actually making the ether wing uh, i just looked through all the artifacts in the set there might be a plan of making the Etherwing um, a, a big threat, and that's equipping the Thopter with the Boomstick and making treasure every turn and having bazillion artifacts, actually. Because yeah. the bo Boomstick itself is an artifact. It makes treasure every turn. It's sort of like the... Oh, yeah, that's a, that's a really good point. I think there's some game plans around it. Um, something that I think we won't... We'll... We'll talk about much more extensively later, too, though, is that yeah, exactly. there's yeah, a yeah, lot I mean, of potential... there, there are some things, yeah. There's some potential for splashing in this format. Now, splashing a blue-red two-mana card is kind of weird, but I think if you did have this card in a deck that had a lot of the, like, Fraction Incubation tokens, like if you were playing, like, green-blue and you had a lot of those, and you wanted the flyer to be able to eventually, like, turn into, like, this huge threat, I think there's different ways to make the flyer work. I, I will say the one awkward thing about this is it makes a legendary vehicle, and you really want as many... Uh, artifacts as possible so if you collect a lot of these you get a lot of the thopters and you can't even flip um your aether wing which is kind of awkward but uh i guess Bad. you just let it sit and play and don't attack it until you're ready for if the first one dies exactly okay let's move to the next 
Is this one mine? <laughs> uh, yeah, I did. Read I the think so. Uh, yeah, yeah. This okay. Is uh, Elvish Rat Keeper is a green black uncommon. Uh, it's one black green for a three three uh, fraction elf, and it says when it enters the battlefield, incubate two, and you can pay five to transform target incubator token you control, double the number of plus one plus one counters on it. Uh, so, I just think you're getting a lot of stats for this card, and that's basically the reason for my grade. I gave it a B. You gave it a C plus. Um, it's nice that. The three, three for three, you can just use that, you know, game piece and trade it off free willy nilly and then eventually get your two, two from the incubate. If the game is going longer and you don't have good attacks and but your opponent also doesn't, then I think the activated ability of paying five to start doubling up all those uh, counters starts to go somewhere. Notably, there are some like incubate three and fours as well. Um, and you could also maybe build like this sort of three or four color where you're splashing some of the uh, incubate enchantment rare, like uh, rares and uncommons sort of as a payoff in your green black deck. I could sort of see that being all in on that. And then suddenly, you know, you flip your incubate four into an eight, eight off this card. And like, that's actually worth paying five mana for. Whereas most of the rest of the time, you're just like, I'm not really going to use that ability. I'm just going to flip it for the two mana. Um, but I see this more as like, obviously a mid range controlling card. But if we also take that from the other green black, signpost where green black maybe is a little bit slower you don't mind trading off this card going to the late game and then somehow just again overwhelming your opponent with you know sheer number of creatures even if it takes you longer to set up that board yeah i mean I, when i was evaluating that i was struggling between c plus and b minus uh, i thought about it for actually quite some time went with the c plus mainly because of my maybe prediction that black green is not going to be that strong it's not going to be weak or anything or i don't predict it to be a bad archetype but i don't think it's going to be like the, one of the top archetypes and that's why i downshifted it a bit to c plus but i fully agree with your evaluation of what the card does and i there are even some incubate five things in green um that are not that expensive so you can actually curve this one into a incubate five spell and in on turn five you can basically swing with a 10 10 if you if, if that's your jam so uh, a minus no <laughs> no, no. I still, I, I, I still think I am in between C plus and B minus uh, in, in the grading that we have here. So yeah, S still a good card. Um, last step convert. Um, this is a Demir one, one blue and black battle siege for defense. When Invasion of Amonkhet enters the battlefield, each player mills three cards, then each opponent discards a card, and you draw a card. This is a formation campaign on a stick, basically. Well, this information campaign was already on a stick. Um, you get to use it one time. And if you flip it, you get a 4-4 zombie. And you may have Lazatip Convert enter the battlefield as a copy of any creature card in a graveyard, except it's a 4-4 black zombie in addition to its other types. Um, so I always like this information campaign. The fact that opponent discards you draw is a good two for one already at its base rate. The mill three for each player also plays well with your other signpost uncommon, which feels nice to graveyards. Also, it plays well with itself because if you fill it with something that is a really strong card with strong abilities, you can copy it and um, get it in a zombie form as a four four. So let's say you flip even a flyer. You flip a flyer, you can get a 4-4 flyer when you flip it, which is a pretty good thing. Um, if you flip something with an even power, more powerful uh, ability, go for it. So I think that it will be slightly dependent how many good targets for copying uh, you will have in your own deck because you don't want to fully count on your opponent. Um, and obviously, these have to be static abilities, not ETB, because... Uh, Oh no, they will. They will enter as a copy. So even if you have like a strong ETB creature, you can basically get the ETB trigger out of it. So if you mill a bomb that has ETB draw brainstorm and or whatever, you 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 get it. And I think that this is just enough for this card to um, to be on a B level because it's a natural two for one, and the upside of uh, flipping it is pretty high. Yeah, the fact that you can get a three for one probably means like it can't be any worse than a B. Uh, minus which which is what you had it at so probably it's out of the c range which i you know we got a c plus there i was just thinking it kind of doesn't help contributing with the flip at all and yes it's a two for one on the surface but it just kind of sits there but maybe that's enough in the set and i was also a little bit worried where if you're kind of just setting it up at some point you never really want to play this on turn three even though 
if you just need to smooth out your hand, that's kind of what you want to do, where there's a lot of the other battles where they're like two mana and they help kind of have those smoothing mechanics by three. I really want to be like getting on board to set up attacking the battles rather than sort of doing that in and of itself. And so maybe you would play it later, but then the discard draw, I don't all that being said, I mean, you can't deny the the sheer card advantage that this card presents. So I'm happy with B minus with it. I just think that it might be a little bit more awkward than it looks. It might be that Demir will suck and then the, then the card will then have it's a lower window. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's still it's probably a C. I mean, let's not get it. But, um, yeah, but yeah. yeah, I mean, the, the card itself is strong. Let's see how Demir will play out. And maybe Demir wants to play more evasive so it doesn't really need the invasion to clear the path because you clear the path yourself by playing evasive creatures. So maybe that's the, the secret of it. Um, all right. We move to white. And maybe before we start, um, I'll take a two-minute break.